Okay, welcome everybody to the third blow up the lecture series of our series this year at ANU. Um, as we always do at ANU, I begin by acknowledging that this is the land of the Ngunnawal people and we recognise their unbroken connection to the past and the education that the Ngunnawal have engaged in both in past, present and future and we pay our respects to their elders, also past, present and future. Welcome. Just a, a technical note before we get going, this session is being live streamed. If you are shy about appearing on camera, the left to, to the left of me is the area that will not be filmed. <laughs> Okay, and you'll notice that there's only one person sitting there at the moment, Alistair. So if you would like not to be filmed, could I ask you, rather than walk right in front of the camera to get to that space, you may wish to go out the back door and then come back in again. I hope you've enjoyed meeting one another and talking, but I am really just here to welcome you all. If you haven't been to one of these events before, we have live streamed before and you can still download and listen to the previous sessions where we had the CEO of edX uh, kick off, Anant Agarwal, then we had Sanjay Sama from MIT, the head of e-learning, come and talk to us. And now we have even more excitement and the youngest panellist yet will be appearing this evening. And I can see he's brought one of his friends, which is terrific. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Philip Clark, who is really our MC for this evening. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. And, uh, and welcome. It's a new experience for me too. So uh, let's hold our hand, uh, each other's hands and... Uh, and go gently into the early evening. Uh, this is sacred ground for me, this lecture theatre, because it was in the front row here that I had my first ever university lecture. So um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the flood of memories that are coming back, some, but mostly good. <laughs> but these were the days, of course, when you know, universities uh, lectured to students who had to attend the lectures, and if they didn't, they suffered accordingly, and that was the only way that information was imparted. Seems a strange time, really, but... Um, People would sit here and record things with a pen and paper, and if they missed it, there was very little chance to get it back. Uh, nothing like today's university experience. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is something, of course, that's, uh, to use comic book terms, a more extraordinarily, unbelievably amazing development ever, and that is the explosion of online learning to massive groups of people. The massive open online courses, the MOOCs, as there, I think it's a pretty dreadful acronym actually, and I, I sort of wish someone had uh, invented something slightly more fancy for it, but there we are, we're stuck with it, <laughs> MOOCs, until some bright young thing comes up with a, with a snappier name. Uh, but uh, that explosion of learning goes far beyond students these days simply listening to things or uh, learning online in a conventional way. This represents a massive explosion and reach of the universities and all the learning that they have out to audiences, uh, is that the correct term to use? Out to, to people who, uh, who have never had the opportunity to get that sort of, and get access to and to engage with that, learn, that sort of learning at that level. It's an amazing opportunity when you think about it. And uh, how it's done, of course, is one of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, it's all very well to, to think of the possibilities that the digital age gives us, which are effectively limitless in terms of the information that we provide, but as I know uh, our own institution, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, we still exist. Uh, uh, although bloodied, bloodied but unbowed, I think is, uh, is, what, is how we, uh, we're looking at ourselves, have found uh, one of the great, uh, one of the great uh, contradictions of the digital age, of course, is that the more successful you are, contrary to normal business rules, uh, you, your costs should come down, but of course, in the digital world, the more successful you are because of service and transmission and digital costs, uh, indeed, the more expensive it is. So uh, th th those are some, that's an issue to be, to be looked at, I guess, as well. But how should MOOCs operate? How should they reach people? And what are the current hurdles that stand in the way of uh, this form of learning becoming more and more ubiquitous? I think. Uh, there's some of the questions that uh, I have tonight. We've, we've got a gathered a panel which I want you to interact with. I hope they'll interact with each other. And uh, it's a chance really in the next hour and a half or, or so to come to grips with some of these things and to, to ask questions because that's what a lot of people are doing in this space uh, right now. So let me introduce our panel tonight. We've got uh, from uh, the University of California at Berkeley, uh, Professor Armando Fox. Armando. Uh, 
uh, and I'll detail Armando's experience with MOOCs shortly. Uh, Professor Gabriel Bama from the ANU, from the School of Population Health and Research. Group. And uh, Gabrielle, as I think well, she told me earlier, is a, is a solver of big problems. No, she didn't say that. She said, I, 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 like, the, I like to work in that area. I, I don't think she would claim to be the solver of big problems just yet, <laughs> but, but perhaps uh, working in that area. Uh, uh, ben Niles is the president of the Postgraduate and Research Students Association. Welcome, Ben. <laughs> and uh, the youngest panellist, as you correctly uh, observed, is... Uh, joining us tonight too, Sam Parkinson. Sam is a Year 8 Tilopia Park School student and uh, he's joined at least by one other classmate, I think, up there as well. So, uh, uh, yes, we've identified you now, so you have to ask a question later. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome to you all. And there's a, there are different levels of engagement and experience here with, uh, with massive open online courses. And uh, I, I suppose if we were to crudely uh, point to it, we've, we have Armando who's got a massive, a massive, I mean, that word's going to be used a lot tonight, isn't it? He's got a, a very large involvement in, in MOOCs. We've, uh, we have Ben, who's tasted some of it. Uh, we have Gabrielle, who's involved in it here at the ANU in terms of getting an ANU project going. Uh, universities everywhere are clamouring to get into this space and asking questions as to how they do it and at what level they should do it and what are they trying to achieve as well. And uh, poor old... Uh, Poor old Sam here has been uh, lumbered with being the future, you see, so <laughs> that's the thing when you're being young though. When you're young, that's the trouble. No one ever asks you questions, they just give you titles. So, so, so Sam, whether you want to be the future or not, you're, you're it, at least for the next, next uh, couple of hours. <laughs> so yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I, I always remember somebody, one teacher saying to me once, you're the generation that's going to solve all the problems that we created. I thought, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you fix them yourselves? <laughs> um, anyway, let's, uh, let's get started. So I thought we would start by getting each panellist to detail uh, their involvement at the moment, what they've been doing. And, uh, and we should start perhaps by explaining to others, is, is everybody familiar with what a MOOC is? Uh, Broadly familiar? Okay, so, yeah, but I, I know some people, no one wants to put up their hand because there'll be some who think, I think I know what it means. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. But So, Amanda, maybe we could start with, because your experience at UC at Berkeley, um, what you're doing, what are you doing first in terms of this particular area? So, I, I actually have a, a number of perspectives and I'm never really sure which hat I ought to be wearing. Uh, I'm a computer science professor there, and that's really until about a year or two ago is all I had ever been. I was not a MOOC expert. I was not advising universities on how or whether or why they should do MOOCs. That all happened after I sort of did a MOOC by accident, and it was really just because the founders of Coursera, who I assume many of you have heard of, uh, one of the first for-profit companies to really sort of uh, take the, the MOOC movement public, as it were, um, our faculty colleagues at Stanford, who are very good friends of ours, and my colleague and I at Berkeley had developed a very successful software course. Stanford didn't really have a, a correspondent course, and we were invited really as a professional courtesy as an experiment to put the course up. And all we really knew is that this would involve hundreds of thousands of people around the world potentially looking at our materials and doing the homework assignments. And the only reason we said yes is because at Berkeley we had been trying to think about how could we offer this course to more Berkeley students. It, it had become very flatteringly for us, a popular course, and we had thought about doing uh, automatic grading and creating special tools that students could use to check their programming assignments without having an instructor intervene, and we thought that if we accepted their invitation, it would really force the issue, and we, we would have to get our story straight about whether it was possible to do. And sort of a few months after that, Berkeley realized MOOCs were going to be a thing, they were exploding in the news, and because I had done one and not zero, I was an expert, and <laughs> they, uh, they asked me to advise and be the liaison to edX with which Berkeley had just formed a relationship. And uh, since then, I think I've learned a lot more about education, about the politics of education. But most importantly for me, uh, my view of teaching has been uh, almost completely transformed. Um, I would say that even if I never cared about doing another MOOC or having hundreds of thousands of people take my MOOC, it has permanently changed the way I teach in the classroom. And I think if I have an ax to grind today, that's the ax. Uh, this is not you know, a flash in the pan kind of a thing where you can watch YouTube videos and learn stuff. This is potentially a way that, that uh, can be transformative in what we do in residential education as well. And that's, that's my bread and butter. You know, the Berkeley students pay my salary. And first and foremost, I have to do the best job I can for them. So that's what I do. I thought that what we were doing is creating MOOCs, but what we're really doing is exploring this new technology avenue that I think could have a profound effect if it's properly handled in how universities teach their students. 
and ultimately high schools and, uh, and uh, middle schools as well. Okay. All right. Uh, Gabrielle, you, now you're, you're embarking on a project here, I understand, at the ANU. Uh, let's, let's talk about your involvement and, uh, and what you're trying to achieve and what you, uh, what you understand to be the nature of the task. So I might just start by saying the ANU's done two MOOCs successfully, one on astrophysics and one on engaging India. And my colleague Mike Smithson and I are part of a group who've been selected to do a MOOC in 2015. And there, there'll be four MOOCs in that lot. Um, Mike Smithson and I are doing a MOOC on ignorance, exclamation mark. And the exciting thing about that for us is that we've never had the opportunity to teach that before because it doesn't fit neatly into a curriculum. So even though it could fit into all sorts of places. So Mike, most of this is Mike's um, brainchild, if you like. He's been working on ignorance for more than a quarter of a century. As a, a PhD, he asked, as a PhD, and, and we get, he's got this great collection of jokes. I wish I had some slides <laughs> I could show you, but he's got terrific cartoons. But when he was a, um, a postgraduate student, he asked the question, well, if knowledge is socially constructed, well, maybe ignorance is socially constructed as well, and has pursued that. So he's um, got a background in mathematics and in sociology. He's done, he's very um, akin to, knows a lot about statistics, but also knows quite a lot about social construction of ignorance and knowledge, and has really developed a whole range of thinking about ignorance that there hasn't really been much of an outlet for. And so he's, he's and, and mostly we think about ignorance as a bad thing. And one of the things that he's really contributed is the benefits of ignorance. So if we didn't have ignorance, we wouldn't have any surprises, for example. We wouldn't have any freedom, for example. So there are a whole lot of ways of thinking about it. So Mike and I teamed up about a decade ago. And my interest is in, is in complex problems and how universities can help people who deal with complex problems do it more effectively. Again, that's not something we're terrifically good at. So we're really good at universities at thinking reductionistically. We're really good at thinking about things that have got perfect answers, that have got clear context, that have got set values. And I'm interested in things you have to think about systemically, where there's values conflict, where the context's really important, where there is no perfect answer, there's just a best, worst, or least, a best possible or least worst solution. And so what I've been interested in is how ignorance fits in with that, because that actually triggers a lot of that thinking. And so he and I have put a MOOC together, which allows him to talk about all the stuff that he's been working about. And then I do a piece at the end, which says, so if we look at the lectures that Mike's given this week, how do they help us deal with complex problems more effectively? So it's been very effective for us in terms of bringing out an area, A, that there are very few people who are expert in, and be where there's, there's actually nowhere else that people can go to get what we're presenting. So that's an exciting part of it. In terms of the work that I'm doing on complex problems, um, there are lots of people who work on complex problems, but we don't have a unified community. We have people all over the world who do pieces of it. And so I'm excited about, in the future, looking at how we could use the best knowledge that we've got, given that there aren't very many people, but make that, bring those people together and make that available to everybody who's interested in this. So when a university doesn't have a strength in an area, but where the, the strength is distributed, how can we use a MOOC to get at that distributed knowledge and make it accessible to people? So for me, those are the, the really exciting things about what we're trying to do. Okay. All right, thank you, uh, Gabriel. Uh, ben, uh, ben, I understand you've, you've, you've put your toe in the water or, or tasted a MOOC, you've not completed one. And this is a topic we might talk about later, actually, the issue of completing MOOCs, uh, as opposed to having a look at them. Uh, um, <laughs> um, uh, ben, tell us about your experience so far. Um, so I'm a postgraduate student here at the ANU. My undergraduate was um, a commerce degree down in Melbourne at Monash Uni. Um, and I'm doing a coursework master's here. Um, I guess my interest in MOOCs has been just an experimentation rather than for the sake of uh, seeking to complete a course. Uh, really from, um, as Phil was saying, I guess the perspective of the future of education. Um, for me, it's really a completely new format that I think everyone has the opportunity to experiment with and trial, um, particularly outside, for me, of your necessarily field of expertise. Um, I think MOOCs offer a whole new range of possibilities to students. Um, 
and I use the word students because I think as soon as you enrol in a MOOC, anyone, whether you're currently studying, um, whether it's in high school at a tertiary education or have completed and no longer doing um, any of the other forms of study, become a student once again. Um, even if it's just a dabble, it provides a whole new world of opportunity. So for me, uh, there's quite an interest in what are the possibilities and what's the potential of MOOCs going forward. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ben. Sam, to you. Uh, have you uh, have you had a had a had a go? Um, yeah, I've had a really small dabble in MOOCs, but like I am interested in computer programming and mm -hmm. like in the world of computer programming, um, one of the big ways that teaching happens is through online courses. So they're not um, they don't have the massive element of MOOCs where you have people interacting, but they still have the element of online learning and. I have, you know, seriously um, completed um, some of them and, you know, coming to MOOC, um, looking at MOOCs, I feel that they're really different to these online courses in mm. a way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But so, but you, so you would say, as as a as a young coder, that in essence, the, the, the your engagement with learning has been has been almost totally online. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, in the field of programming, I mean, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah. And yeah, I've sort of seen good things about, you know, the whole potential of online learning. Mm. Mm. How, how's that, ex how's the learning experience felt? I mean, I don't know whether you can compare it, but comparing it to, to another another form of learning, a direct classroom learning, you're in year eight, cause, so you're getting a good dose yeah. of that as well. So h how would you how would you look at those, both those learning experiences for you? I mean, how does it feel? Yeah, well, I've, I actually find them really hard to compare because, I mean, when you're doing, um, you know, direct classroom learning, like, for example, if you're doing maybe a science, you know, science, um, you'll be, you know, you're in the science lab, you might be doing practical things and, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's very different like online learning um, programming in a way to online learning for many other things because um, if you're doing computer related things, the, you are doing a practical thing as soon as you started off a computer, right? So it's... It is a really, I, I don't really know how to compare them at all. I think mm. that they're... They're because they're so really completely different. Yeah. They're completely different. And, and uh, exactly, and that's the essence of it too. All right, look, we've got a roving microphone. Where's our roving? Uh, yes. <laughs> and you're, you're monitoring our Twitter feed as well. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, we have a roving microphone here. Uh, yes, a hand in the air. So please, anybody who wants to join this discussion, there's an opportunity for, for you to talk about. You want to, if you want to talk about your own experiences or, or ask a question of the panel, uh, or raise some questions that, that we should be asking. We've got one at the back here, yes. Wasn't that sweet of you? You always come all the way around. <laughs> Actually, it's... <laughs> around the door. That's right. The other door. We really need a hospital pass up there, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> See, I know this lecture theatre rather well as well. <laughs> this is where I had my first lecture 40 years ago. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, speaking of lectures in here 40 years ago, um, one of the advantages of you needing to be here was the horror of the Socratic method. I'm sure you remember it well. I do, yes. But the purpose of the Socratic method, apart from terrifying students, was to establish that they had actually done the reading and that they did actually understand the subject matter of the course. They couldn't steal it from someone else. Well, we know that online this is the major problem. In fact, it's a problem with universities generally because we've gone away from reliance on exams. So now people hand in assignments and you've no idea whether they've written the assignment or not. You don't have it's not in handwriting any longer. It's all done in some TypeScript. How do you know it's theirs? And in fact, we know that there are a thousand for-profit companies out there mm. that are making billions out of writing papers for students. There's just one that's been caught recently in Australia, which goes to show that some of them are occasionally stupid, but most of them aren't. Mm. Mm. What are you going to do with MOOCs about knowing that the work that people are doing is their own? How are you going to give a qualification to someone who's completed their course or even a unit in their course by doing well, MOOCs. Well, that's a good, that's a good question, Amanda. Can I go to you on this? Because it really gets back to a question that uh, I suggest I was going to wrap up the, uh, with, with, but you said, now let's get to it first because that's really the key question is, how do you know that, the, that you've had any success in, in, uh, in MOOCs? What is the measure of success? How do you measure it? Yeah, there's a, a great many threads to pull on. So uh, thank you for asking the question. I'll, I'll pay you afterward according to our agreement where you were. No, I'm kidding. Uh, perceptively asked. Uh, let, me, let me try two ways to answer it. And then I'm sure there's going to be many other threads mm. the other panelists want to pull on. Uh, I'm going to also, in answering it, I'm going to partially use the Socratic method. Observe. Sam, have you cheated in any of your online programming courses? No. <laughs> Why not? 
Um, because, well, then I wouldn't actually learn programming and... Thank you. So, <laughs> hold on. This is, this is, uh, he That's said something very... That's important he, answer, actually. This, this, this is the most important thing you're going to hear all night. He actually wanted to learn programming. Uh, th there's a deep philosophical question that I think a lot of universities, certainly in the U.S., possibly here as well, have been struggling with for quite some time. And I think one of the effects of MOOCs is that by surfacing some practical issues such as cheating, which I agree is rampant. You know, my answer to your question, how do we know the students' work is their own in a MOOC, is that we don't. And we tell them ahead of time, we are not gonna, we're, we're investing zero effort in monitoring for cheating because Berkeley's MOOCs are not offered for credit. There's no tuition being charged. This is for your benefit. If you want to cheat on a course that isn't graded for which you're not paying, um, you know, more power to you. But <laughs> the, the deeper problem that I think it reveals is that I think universities have a little bit of an identity crisis around things like what grades actually mean and what it is you're supposed to be measuring when you sign off on a student having earned a certain degree. Um, in fact, I, I, I just finished reading a few months ago a very provocatively written book, Excellence Without a Soul, uh, written by a longtime dean of students at Harvard that tackles this along with many other issues. So the pragmatic answer to your question, in my view, is it's a, an open challenge that may or may not ever be resolved to detect uh, with definitive accuracy whether someone is cheating in a MOOC. But I would argue that that maybe is chasing the wrong question. If the purpose of the MOOC materials is to empower people like Sam who want to learn and the role of the university or of the mentor becomes uh, in a certain sense to certify that they've learned, then those, those processes are separable. Exams are one way to calibrate them. You know, we, we have exams in a controlled setting and it's proctored and you're observed, but there are other ways as well. For example, uh, a lot of courses in engineering require a design project that is open-ended. You can cheat on a homework, but your project is different from the other team's project, and you can't cheat on that. And it becomes very quickly relevant, uh, very quickly clear, which students have actually prepared for the design project by doing the background work. Uh, in my field, which also is software, like Sam's field, uh, a lot of the companies that recruit our best students, and we have awesome students at Berkeley, I have to say. It's a great program. It's a privilege to be there. And the companies tell us, yeah, we don't really look at their grades. We look at their, cord, their code portfolio on GitHub, uh, which is a very popular site where programmers who work on public projects that they, they don't wish to keep proprietary, they will post them for everyone to see. Uh, we ask them to come in for an interview. We ask them to solve some coding problems. We want to observe how they think through the problem. And you can't cheat through an interview. So I'm not suggesting that universities ought to outsource the, the certification process to employers and graduate schools, but I'm suggesting that we can separate the transmission of material and providing materials that students can use in a self-guided way, maybe with some instructor assistance, from the process of someone else saying, okay, now that you've learned the material, let's sit down and find a way to assess what it is you really mastered or not. Um, and I, for my part, I'm going to continue to spend this much effort, that's a zero for people in audio only, uh, on actually monitoring for cheating in the MOOC itself. I'm gonna to continue to rely on the other mechanisms in my campus course and in my interactions with employers and with graduate admissions committees as the, the sort of final cross check. That's one opinion, I'd, yeah, I'd like no, to exactly, hear others. Exactly. Anybody else, Gabrielle, what do you think? I mean, what is the measure of success? Well, let me just address that question too. I think that you've hit the nail on the head. That's certainly the way that I've been thinking about it too, is you've got to separate the provision of the information from the assessment of how well people are doing. So let me just share with you something that I've been thinking would be a fabulous thing to do. So just imagine you get the best people in the world to put together a master's course. In my case, it'd be on dealing with complex problems. And so these are people from around the world. You've got the very best people Anybody can listen to those lectures, but each university sets up its own way of assessing that course. So runs its, so the, the assessment for it is run through a specific university with a much smaller group of people. And what they do is they use whatever they like of the online material as part of the teaching portfolio. They can add to it if they want to. They can use parts of it or not all of it. But they design their own course drawing from what they like of that MOOC and perhaps other MOOCs and perhaps some on online teaching. So what it does is, and I think that's something you raised too, it really changes the way you think about teaching a class and the resources that you've got to, to draw on in teaching a class and the exciting things you can do around assessment. So you're not spending the class time with students talking at them. What you're doing is you're spending the class time with students working on a problem or they're presenting or whatever and you can give much more intense um, tuition, if you like, so that you can go back to really the, the kind of Socratic method. You can actually, and if you're a tough teacher, you can, you know, students can't get away with bullshit, if you like. They really have to 
think, they really have to have shown that they've done the reading, they really have to show that they've listened to the lectures, and you've got the potential to really do something exciting. It won't work if we try to make education cheap. It'll only work if people have a lot of time, if the teacher has a lot of time to spend in the classroom and to work with students intensely. If, we're trying to, if we want to make MOOCs a cheap form of education where people do self-assessment and that's the end of it and they get a degree, that's never going to work. That's, then we're going to go back to the problems you talk about. But if we take this to really think about education deeply, it gives us a wonderful opportunity to, to do some really exciting things. Hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, question here. Yeah, so I'll just add, I also sat here in my very first lecture a couple of years ago. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> I think it was Foundations of Australian Law taught. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm also in Sam's position. I um, did a, like an online coding course um, on Code Academy, which was like teaching me how to use HTML and do a bit of basic programming, something I don't do here. Um, and I found that sitting at my desk, um, learning how to type code, um, miss some intangible benefits that sitting in a lecture has. So there's no like interaction with students, there's no face-to-face -face interaction with lecturers and things like that. Do you think that like MOOCs should address these sort of intangible benefits or whether they're, they're relevant at all to MOOCs? Amanda, do you? Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I've always got something to say, so yeah, you, no, you yeah. should pick other people. But, um, so l let me be controversial and say that no, I don't think MOOCs should address those differences, although I think they're extremely important differences. But to me, that's a little bit like saying, this is a great hammer, but it doesn't screw screws in very well. Should the hammer address that? The MOOC is a different kind of tool, in my view. And I think you're absolutely right that, that uh, you know, Gabrielle earlier uh, referred to the fact that according to one of the very widely held theories of learning, knowledge is something that's socially constructed. That the idea that you're interacting with colleagues is an integral part of learning the material. Learning is not something you can do in a vacuum on your own. Now, if you look at the way people are using MOOCs, and I know some of this anecdotally because we survey the students in our MOOC, and you know, there's respondent bias and all that stuff, but modulo that, uh, we find that students, for example, who live in the same city will on their own organize little study groups where they'll meet at a coffee house, for example, or students who are at a particular university. We have students who are using our material, even though they're enrolled in a degree program at another university, the coursework that we're offering is not available to them for whatever reason, but they are already colleagues and they're, they're in a lot of the same courses, so they'll find a, a dorm room or a university classroom that's unused, and they will re-inject this critical ingredient of interacting with your peers. In fact, I and others are trying to do research on how to enable some kinds of interaction even when the students are physically separated. Can they interact over chat or over video? Or what can we do to sort of bring part of that back into the MOOC? But it's not because the MOOC needs to solve all the world's problems. It's because we recognize that part of what learning is is socially constructing new knowledge with your peer group. And to the extent that we can make it easy to connect things to the MOOC that enable that, that's hugely important. Um, and by the way, let me just, as I love code. Code's what I do. I eat, live, breathe, drink code. It's great. Well, I don't drink code. Um, I drink other things. But uh, an unusual thing about code specifically, and I think one of the reasons that it was sort of first out of the gate for MOOCs and, and these other online coding courses which predate MOOCs, you know, if you're taking a MOOC on, let's say, physics uh, or chemistry or medicine, you may have the best simulations of a rocket taking off or simulations of surgery, but that's not the same as cutting open a cadaver, right? When you're coding online, you're doing the real thing. There's no difference between the activity you're doing in a coding course online and actually coding. It's the same activity. So in some sense, we, sh we should almost, and I say this as someone who loves coding, we should back away from it a little bit because it is such a special case. Um, it's also a special case because the people who do that, the people in that field, like me, are also the ones who have the technical wherewithal to create the tools that are being used for MOOCs. So I, I would propose that we temporarily take it out of the equation. It, it's, it, it's sui generis enough that I don't know how much we'll be able to generalize from what has worked well for coding schools. Okay, I mean, that's what does raise a question. I mean, uh, uh, is it suitable for all forms of, of, the, of the imparting of knowledge, Gabrielle? Is it, is it, or are there some things that really uh, oughtn't be attempted via, via a MOOC? Well, that's, it's a challenge for our MOOC because we're, um, we, ours isn't technical, we're not imparting technical knowledge as a lot of other MOOCs are, right? We're trying to give people some analytical skills and that's a bit higher up the food chain of, of learning. And so we're really very strongly exercised about how do we do that. So what we can, so um, 
one of the things that is happening on edX is that the, the MIT has developed unhangouts which allow people to get together. So we're looking at how we can bring that in. We're looking at how we can have meetups as part of what we do um, so that students can interact and so that we can facilitate learning. But I think for the sort of work that we're doing, a combination of MOOCs, and I've forgotten what the little ones are called. Are they called SOOCs? SPOX. That's right. It's just to give you another acronym, <laughs> which is a specific, a specific, specific. On, a specific <laughs> courses. So if you combine the, the massive with the specific, you can kind of get the best of both worlds. And that's the interaction that I'm interested in in the long term. Yeah. Is, is, the, is the point, you know, I mean, to, to write, pick up something you raised at first up, I mean, this was the issue of credentialing and credentials, et cetera. Is to talk about credentials really to miss the point of, of, of the discussion about MOOCs anyway? Ben? If I mm -hmm. could jump in. I guess uh, a lot of how I see MOOCs is, and perhaps this addresses more a philosophical question, mm. um, when you develop a MOOC, and perhaps Armando and Gabrielle can touch and Sam even, I find that there's this concept of providing something free and open to everyone. Mm. Um, and perhaps in that sense, accreditation or assessment sometimes isn't necessarily the goal of... Um, mm. Which is traditionally, we've thought of that. We've thought about exactly. assessment and credentialing, and how well did you do, and what qualification did you get, and from which, you know, and from which institution. So we can rank all of that and, uh, and have a menu of scores against which we can assess whether you're any good or not. Something, for those of you who were in attendance or maybe watched online, um, the previous uh, talk, with Sanjay was something that I found quite interesting that he raised was, I guess, the philosophical question of this is something that can be provided to people all over the world from different backgrounds, perhaps from rural backgrounds or low socioeconomic backgrounds, um, or in countries or places where uh, people don't necessarily have the opportunity to access university education or um, a higher form of education like we are privileged to here in Australia. Um, and I'm not sure the hits that you guys have had on your MOOCs yet and how you've been able to track that, but um, it was something really interesting that Sanjay raised in something, I guess, going completely away from this whole uh, element of using MOOCs as a tool to replace necessarily lectures and uh, courses that are being offered within a university, but also offering them free to the public online as a way of, I guess, advancing education throughout the world and providing something that I guess didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago where now I guess you have the flash in the pan learning something off YouTube or Googling something and checking it up on Wikipedia, however much you want to rely on that as a source. But uh, now to this, you know, something really specifically developed by some of the leading academics from around the world um, that can be accessed by anyone from any background and any age. Mm. So, I mean, back with you, Sam. I mean, you, you've got to <laughs> go through the dreadful gatekeeping that happens at school, of course, and and that's you know that is a form of credentialing because you can't avoid it, and uh, you know we've designed a system to force you through it. So uh, and that'll culminate in year twelve with the dreaded HSC and the and the and the ATAR system, which will determine initially yeah. at least if you were to go to an institution, it will determine which institution you get to go to. Uh, but you said earlier that there, you didn't really see any, any comparison whatsoever between that, that form of credentialing and what you were doing online. That is, because you know, online, yeah, I mean, so talk some more about that, about, uh, about what's, what's more important to you. Well, um, I suppose like online is, it's, it's a really awesome opportunity because I mean, you can go on and you can learn anything. Whereas, you know, with the traditional forms, you don't have that, you gotta, you know, you got to enrol, you got to make a big commitment, and yeah, I suppose. That's hmm. I mean, and, and to some extent, the issue of of uh, authentication and credibility is is tied up with that whole issue of, of yeah. authentication, isn't it? Because people want the thing, the, whether it's the degree from a prestigious institution or the admission to a particular course. Mm -hmm. So therefore, whatever it takes, uh, okay. whatever it takes, which, which is the antithesis, really, of what we're talking about with MOOC education. Well, you know, there is somewhere that there's, a, to your question there's, there's a shake-up yeah. waiting to happen here, right? Because I yeah. think that, again, let's try to sort of pop up a couple of levels from the, the question I think is really being asked here. Mm -hmm. The idea that there's a finite and relatively small number of elite institutions that uh, an accreditation from that institution is considered uh, to have economic value. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a return on investment. You, you pay some tuition, but it will likely put you in, in a selection pool for better economic opportunities. The entire model of 
filtering and ranking and scoring and ATAR and all the other crap that goes along with it is based on the fundamental assumption of extreme scarcity. That, that education is a product that is in very short supply relative to the demand. Now, I don't think that MOOCs are going to fundamentally change that equation. I think that there is such a thing as a scarce resource of great instructors having face time with great students. And you know, as was pointed out earlier, the, the interaction with smart peers and with a mentor who can sort of be a tour guide through, through a, a body of knowledge, that's not going to go away. But having said all that, there is a tremendous amount of stuff that we can now offer to people very, very cheaply because of the, the blessings of technology and Moore's Law. And what the, the missing piece that I think we haven't seen yet is what are the intermediate credentials, if you will, to which value is going to be assigned that are not a university degree but that recognize uh, some combination of you've absorbed the knowledge and you've proven it to me somehow. You've come into my office and you've written a program on demand. I can certify that not only did Sam claim to have taken the course, he can actually write code to solve these different problems. At some point, someone will be the arbiter of a system in which that metal has value. And that will be a profound change for universities because we've been the only ones holding the bag of metals until recently. Hmm. It may be that, that I plan to be retired. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, may, it may be, as many HSC students have found too, that uh, the credentialing uh, has a very short shelf life and usually lasts as long as you're halfway through your first university co course when people work out whether you, you can actually do the work or not, uh, regardless of what your, your past performance was. Uh, yes, to a question at the back there. Uh, my question is, can MOOCs uh, coexist and cooperate with more traditional forms of online distance education. So I've been teaching a course online at the Australian National University for five years. It's got a course code, the students pay money, uh, they have assessment, the only thing is they do it online. So um, it uses many of the same techniques as MOOCs, um, but there's a small number of students, they get charged a lot of money. Do these, um, I mean, do these two forms of online education coexist, or will MOOCs replace other such forms? Hmm. Gabriel? Well, I, you know, I think what, what we're going to end up with is, um, well, so one thing we could end up with is that the delivery becomes free to anybody, and you could do that in your course now if you wanted to, and it's the assessment, the accreditation is what you're actually paying for. And you can pay for it at an elite university or at a community college, depending on what your ability is and what you want to, and you know what you care about and what you can afford to pay, I guess. Um, so it seems to me that that's going to be part of it. But I think the other part of it is that um, there is there is some advantage in the big, but there's also some advantage in the small. And I think it's figuring out what those two are and what, the, what we would lose if we lost all online education. I think we've, we've been thinking a lot about face-to-face -face classroom teaching and what MOOCs help us do about that and flipped classrooms and all that sort of stuff. We haven't thought as much as far as I'm, as in the kind of reading that I've done about what it does to classical online education. And I think what's been interesting to me is that I don't think MOOCs have learnt a lot of the lessons from classical online education either. I think there's, you know, there's quite a lot that we could learn from the experience that's been gained. Hmm. Yeah, we'll go to, yeah, yes, a question at the back then to you. So. Do we need, to, we need the microphone? I think yep. we do. Well, then we'll go, I think we've got some tweets we'll go to. Yes, we'll go there. Hmm. I've got you, sir, down the front. Yes. Um, perhaps uh, you need to look at a hybrid model. You know, why, why should it just be the one thing? Um, uh, perhaps uh, the core material that would be digested in a, in a lecture could be observed on, on a moot say, you know, an hour before the lecture with the students operating privately and then uh, you come to the lecture theatre having blogged points in the, in the lecture um, and the, the, the lecturer having reviewed some of those and plucked some that he'd like to talk about and also to have the students there interacting with the material maybe for two hours rather than just the one call, one, one hour on the lecture, which may or may not be more relaxing for the for the lecturer, uh, and uh, perhaps it's more engaging, They're giving the, the people there more, more opportunity to meta-think over the material. That people worked in teams, you know, uh, you know in, in law, if you've got to do all the hack work, you don't get to do anything clever because you're there, and if it's only you by yourself, you're, you're just grinding through the material of research, you have to grind through it, or economics like Danny Rodrick, beautiful writer, you know, he's got a pet professor that does his number crunching for him, this sort of thing. You know, if, but if that's all you're doing, the, the, the hack work, you can't do the more powerful thinking because you're probably exhausted and, and such like. So I'm just thinking of those sort of techniques where you use a hybrid and, and more enabling people 
to engage with the material rather than just sitting there, oh, it's a lecture. Look, he's talking at 300 words a minute and writing with two hands, <laughs> you know, which is not, not really a very lovely experience. Uh, and, and so it could be more powerful, but just moving it around, I think, is, is, is what you need to do mm. and, and try various things in various okay. forms. Anybody want to comment on, on that? Yeah, a, a lot of us are doing that. <laughs> the, the TLDR, a lot of us are doing that. Um, some people call it flipped classroom. Uh, some people call it... Uh, you know, section-based or project-based or problem or laboratory-based learning. Uh, but there's many variations of, there's some stuff you can do online to sort of gather the background, and then there's some stuff where you go and work with peers and perhaps under the supervision of an instructor or somebody on the teaching staff. And I think, because now I'm going to try to address your question and also the previous one about whether MOOCs can or would replace uh, existing online models, it, I think what MOOCs have forced us to do, for better or worse, and here I'm referring to both university residential courses as well as online courses, is to really, I hate to use this word, deconstruct the value proposition inherent in each of those courses. What is the thing you're paying for when you pay for an online course that you're not paying for when you see the exact same assets packaged in a MOOC? One possibility is you're paying for accreditation by a trusted source. Somebody who is an authority and a teacher and an expert signs off that you know, you're worthy to pursue a career in this field. Another thing you might be paying for is a very experienced tour guide. We call that a teacher. And it's, you know, most of the knowledge that I teach in my software engineering course, I didn't invent. In fact, you can find most of it on the internet. There's too much of it. My role is to actually tell the students what's important and what order I believe they should do it in. And that's my opinion. And then go to 50 other top universities, talk to 50 other top professors, and get 50 other opinions all equally valid. It's really a matter of what the student is after and what kind of career they want to pursue. So again, I think it comes back to what is the scarce resource that we're charging you for? Because that's sort of basic economics, right? When we charge you for something, the premise is that there's some scarcity behind the resource. There's a finite amount of it, and we need to charge as a way of doing admission control. It could be teacher time. It could be accreditation. It could be the sophistication of the accreditation process. Um, and I think universities have sort of bundled all of this stuff together and said, ah, you get the degree. All of that stuff has been rolled in somewhere. And I think MOOCs are forcing uh, a lot of these instruments to sort of be broken out piece by piece and say, OK, well, where, where is my tuition going? How much of my tuition is teacher time? How much of it is lab facilities? How much of it is access to other intelligent students who are my peers and from whom I'm going to learn even more than I learned from my instructor? And I think it, and it's a salutary exercise for universities to have to go through that, and a very painful one. Mm -hmm. But I think that's really the root of, of both of the questions, if I might be so bold. OK, all right. Now we've got some, yeah, Gabrielle, I'll go to you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. One point, and that's to pick up on what both Ben and Sam said, which is that MOOCs also give you the opportunity to taste stuff so that you, f you, don't have to, you don't have to sign up for a whole course. But you can, if there's stuff that you think you might be interested in, and I think they're really important for people starting out on their learning, their lifelong learning, is to, that they can expose themselves to a whole lot of things that, 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 that they think might be interesting, but they don't know before they kind of enrol in a course. By the time you get to university, and even now at school, you're having to sign up, you, you know, you're having to strip your options back. And MOOCs allow you to keep your options open and to, to learn about a whole lot of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily learn about otherwise. And I think that's a, a great advantage. Heavens above, being at university and then going to things outside your course. Yeah, quite. Oh, how extraordinary concept. I know, I agree. <laughs> we've got, some, we've got some, some tweets, have we? Yeah, we've, we've got a question from uh, Glenn, who's watching the live stream. Mm -hmm. Hi, Glenn. Uh, he's got a question for Armando and would like to ask you about the feedback you got for your MOOC and what worked and what didn't. It depends on which student you ask. Uh, and I think this comes back to the idea that, you know, we, we got, so first of all, generally speaking, we got a lot of very positive feedback that was very flattering for us as instructors. Uh, the fact that there are students, many of whom are actually working professionals with full-time jobs, who are taking time out with really no remuneration to them uh, to take the time to work on our material is sort of the highest compliment an instructor can receive. So a lot of the feedback we got was, thank you for putting it out there. Uh, we've Literally, we've had uh, people say, because of the knowledge from your course, we've been able to sort of start a small company and, and break into a, a better employment situation. So those things are all very flattering. At the same time, there were a number of students who really didn't agree with the way that we taught the material. It's not that they weren't interested in the material, but we went too fast for them, or we assumed uh, a level of knowledge or a way of thinking about programming that maybe was not what they were accustomed to. Uh, we, or maybe there was something about the pacing of the course that they didn't like. Uh, some students had suggestions as to how they would teach the material differently. And with respect, we said, great suggestions. We're going to keep doing it the way we're doing it because it works for our students and it works for us. So we learned a lot from doing it. There's a lot of people who liked it. There's a number of people who really didn't care for it. And that's good feedback, too. It doesn't change what we're doing, but I think it reinforces the fact that different 
learners will have different ways that they want to uh, be presented the material. And to the extent that what we're doing for our students at Berkeley, and let me, you know, let me make this perfectly clear, Berkeley did not get into this to make money because there isn't any to be made. Berkeley did not get into this to put great courses out there for free in the rest of the world, although as a public university, we love it when that happens. Berkeley got into this because we think we need to stay on top of our competitive edge for teaching. This is something we're doing because our faculty and students are going to benefit. That's our first job. So everything in my MOOC is there because it serves Berkeley students in some way. And to the extent that other students around the world can benefit, I feel great about that. Um, things that I wish had worked better, uh, I, I've discovered uh, as a, a matter of humility and as an instructor that I had certain ideas about uh, the level of proficiency of certain students in terms of their ability to write high quality code, code that's clean and elegant and concise and whose design intent is transparent. Uh, I have found out through the MOOC that uh, the level of proficiency is not as uniform as perhaps I had thought. And then I thought, well, surely it's because these students are out there in the rest of the world. If I look at just the Berkeley cohort, surely as a group they'll be much stronger. And doing the MOOC forced me to look, and they're actually not, right? There's almost as much variation across our students as there is in the rest of the world. So it actually has helped me gain new insights about the students I teach, and it's causing me to make changes in my material that, again, they're for the benefit of my students, but it was all these other students responding to our material that allowed us to draw those inferences. So as an instructor, it's probably been the biggest learning experience I've had you know, since I started doing this job 10 or 12 years ago. Hmm. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Uh, yes. It, yeah, well, yes, it goes, uh, it goes some way to it, I'm sure. Um, I've got a question down the front here. Yes. Just one moment, Sarah, and we'll get the microphone to you. Hi. Um, I looked at the EDX uh, thing on the computer, and I was interested to find when I looked at their, uh, they had the samples of, of courses, so just one lesson from each course over a range of uh, physics, chemistry, and various other topics. But what interested me was to find that the most effective sample was a straight filmed lecture. All, all the other samples that had fancy computer graphics and all sorts of other things were not as effective as that straight lecture. Now this probably was because that lecturer was a very good lecturer, I think. Uh, for those, it was a uh, classic uh, physics lecture of the simple pendulum where, in which he stands at one side of the lecture theatre and he has a pendulum bob this big, holds it to his forehead, lets it go whizzing over the other side of the lecture theatre and then it comes back and it sort of stops just short uh, of his forehead. So it's a very spectacular uh, demonstration. But, but the, the uh, lesson also contained the other things where he did the conservation of energy and the simple algebra of the pendulum and so on. And it, it was very uh, effective. The interesting point to me is it was much more effective than any of their other samples, which uh, had obviously involved uh, a great deal of uh, computer work and so on, but they still weren't as effective as a simple lecture. Mm. Has this been the experience so far that we uh that we find that's the new teaching tools that emerge of, of graphic interface and, uh, and so on are, are more effective than, than simply one expert human talking to others? You, I know you want to answer so this. So first thing. of all, let me just say that uh, I took freshman physics from that professor. That's Walter Lewin at MIT. And he is an extraordinary, extraordinary presenter. Uh, he was legendary uh, even when I was an undergraduate, which I think was in the, the Jurassic period or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so I appreciate that uh, a thing that I think a lot of successful MOOCs do have in common, and the students react to this when we survey them and we ask them, uh, the, the ability of the presenter to be clear and engaging and interesting and lucid and transparent has a tremendous amount to do with uh, the students' perceived effectiveness of the, of the teaching. Having said that, effectiveness is a word that I, is almost by definition subjective. So I think what you probably meant to say was, uh, if you don't mind my putting words in your mouth, that what you found most effective was Walter Lewin's presentation of conservation of energy using the pendulum. But would Sam find that as effective as an alternate presentation of the same material in a different format using different tools? Open question. Open question. We is, get is my claim. We could ask Sam. We, we, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely, it's a follow-up. Yeah. yeah, can we get the mic back? Yeah. So we're just monitoring our feed here, don't we? 
We're not checking Facebook, but that's another question. Uh, you know, well, well, of course, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I realised I could be biased. Uh, so I, I tried this out on a small group of my friends, uh, none of whom were physicists. And uh, they all found the, the most effective lesson was, was the sa same one that I, I had found. Now, I admit it, it was only a very small sample, so probably not statistically significant. <laughs> Gabriel. The yeah. point is that, that Amanda is making is that what MOOCs allow you to do is to develop courses for different, for, for different kinds of learners. So um, you can, you can, so it's, what we've got now is a, we've got a one size model that everybody's got to take basically. And what this allows you to do is to um, look at different ways. So the, just as you said, you found some students really liked your, your style of teaching but, and some students didn't. And those, what we can do then is to develop a course that caters to those students. And I think that's, that's really one of the powerful things about MOOCs is that you can, that everybody's and different learning styles can be accommodated. I think that's really important. But I also have to say, I reckon if any of my physics lecturers had gotten up and, and put a, a wrecking ball and swung it at their faces, I would have been pretty engaged as yeah. well. I mean, it's, there's, there's an issue here, isn't there, the point you make about teaching styles, because universities once, of course, never ever recorded their lectures and said you had to attend. Then they started recording them which did lead to a lot of students not attending lectures, not because of laziness, not because of laziness, but actually some students, and this has been my direct experience in talking to them, some students actually prefer not to go to the lecture, but prefer to listen to the lecture um, at, at, in, their, in their own time because they find it a better learning experience because they can stop, they can interrogate um, online a point they don't quite get, uh, or with other students, and they can work through the lecture that way. Now, you know, that's not that's my not my personal preference. I'm with you. I would prefer somebody to speak to me. But uh, so, but it's been an interesting development, isn't it? So it's not just absenteeism for its own sake. It's actually because some students prefer this. What about you, Ben? Um, I was actually going to jump in at this point too. I think perhaps what Gabriel was uh, mentioning is also something that's really quite new um, in the world of education generally. This opportunity for and this is the way I see it, I guess. University is almost showcasing um, some of the best teaching styles that they have on offer. Um, and students being able to then kind of search through and sample uh, other styles of teaching. Uh, I guess what Phil didn't touch on regarding online lectures is you can also then speed up your lecture to 1.5 or two times the regular <laughs> speed uh, when they're speaking a little bit too slowly. But Not if it's a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> He's but I, yeah. I guess maybe it's something Sam may have experienced too, but even early this semester in studying for exams, uh, one of the concepts in my uh, law course that I struggle with, I then decided to just search online and find other um, videos and documents produced by other universities on a very specific concept um, that I thought might have explained it a little bit better. And I guess that was a way that I was able to sample um, this kind of almost free and online uh, sharing that universities are starting to do by putting up lectures online and uh, things like that. I'm not sure whether, Sam, you've ever... I totally agree with you. Like when I'm trying to revise for my tests or do something like that, I am, I, it's, it's just amazing to have all of these resources available by the internet. And I mean, um, this isn't really a MOOC specific thing, but if MOOCs are going to allow you're going to encourage people to, you know, put more of these resources out there because, I mean, there are people doing all of these lectures every day, and I mean, if a MOOC means that they put these lectures online, I mean, that's a, that means that there's so much more available, and, I, yeah, I think that MOOCs can actually let you better utilise um, what's already being done because, you have access to um, a certain person's explanation even if they might live halfway around the world, mm. and if this person's explanation is good, well. Why aren't you using it? Sure. How important are the kids? How, how important is talking to other kids? Oh, I, I think it's really important. Because hmm. um, you're not doing that online, yeah. though, are you? Well, you, no, you, well, can. you can. You can, I know. Yeah. But it's not, as we all know, it's not the same. Yeah, well, I, I've had a look at a lot of the books, and I think a lot, some of them try and really integrate discussion. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it's, I totally agree with you. It, it's not the same. Um, having an online discussion as it is. So you'd still like rate that as very important for him as a human, as a, as a learning experience. So the idea that you're, you're actually talking with other kids yeah. about, about what you're doing. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Mm.
Sorry, Gabriel. So there's another dimension of MOOCs that we haven't talked about yet, which is that they actually also give you research capacity. So one of the things we're doing in our MOOC is that um, the lectures that I'm giving are being given in two different modes so that students can choose the one that they prefer. Um, and that gets to some of what you're talking about. But you can do other kinds of um, research as well. So we're, what Mike's doing is he's doing surveys of people. You can do randomised control trials on MOOCs. You can do a whole sorts of really interesting and exciting additional research that involves the student and you can give the student feedback on that. So getting students involved in, in projects is also a really good learning experience. Hmm. Is there a fundamental? What's a? I really, we perhaps we should have started with this as a fundamental thing. What's the target audience? Do we, do we think about that when we when des we're designing a MOOC, or we just setting a ship out on the ocean? Is there a target audience? My under? target audience is third and fourth year UC Berkeley computer science majors. That's my audience. Okay. Now the good news is apparently there are tens of thousands of other people in the world who are are in some sense part of that audience that are not in my classroom. Right. And I can tell because they say they like what we do and they say they've learned a lot from it. But that's my audience. Okay. Gabrielle, is that what you're, th you're thinking in that targeted way? Um, so we've got different um, perspectives on this. So Mike, Mike's course, Mike's part of the course is suitable for um, basically any discipline because ignorance is relevant to every discipline. So it's, it's much more, <laughs> it's much more um, uh, widespread, if you like, in its applicability. But he's thinking about an undergraduate level. I'm thinking about, for the complex problem stuff, I'm thinking about people who've got experience with complex problems. But I'm actually starting to realise that that might not work because the, um, the number, the people who are going to enrol, um, want, I think part of it is if you have the bar too high, it, it alienates some people. And that's, you've really got to think about what, am I going to, what are those people going to do when they get to this piece of the course? Are they going to get annoyed because they can't contribute? Or, um, so that's a bit that we're curious to see what the, the impact of it is. Um, but, but ours is kind of a much bigger audience. And, and what we really want to do is to get people excited about ignorance. So I'm hoping you're all going to see. Mm. Yeah, question over here. Mm. Um, I've got a question that's more specifically for Ben and Sam, but everyone can contribute if they want. Um, I'm actually designing a MOOC at the, at the moment on an introduction to actuarial studies, and I've been pondering the role of assessment within MOOCs, um, because obviously, given that we don't have the accreditation issues with, uh, with MOOCs, you then wonder what is the purpose of assessment, and in my little dream world, I ditched assessment altogether. It doesn't exist. You, you're doing it because you want to do it. But then the more I thought about it, we live in the, you know, the, the PlayStation and Xbox age of trophies and achievements and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, well, maybe that becomes the new role of assessment as a form of motivation. So I'm curious to know from, from your perspectives, what is the role of assessment, and you can define that however you want, within an online learning experience? Mm. But Sam, do you want to go first? Oh, is, 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 is getting a good mark important or is understanding uh, it more important? Yeah, well, I suppose, you know, having any form of assessment and stuff is always a real motivator. But I also think, like, personally, from my experience, that, um, you know, if you're just listening to a lecture, then that's great, you're absorbing facts. But, I mean, a lot of the time assessment forces you to think analytically about these things. And that that's, I mean, that, that's obviously specific to whatever subject you're doing your MOOC on. But I also think that if, as well as that, if you're teaching skills, I think that assessment is a really important thing because um, I, I don't know what this is like in, you know, um, university. It, it, it's probably there, but assessment is a real point where, you know, you've, you've done a piece of work and you've been forced to do this piece of work, so now, we, so now someone can give you feedback on this, on this piece of work. And I think that that's probably... That, that's where I think assessment is going, and I, that's where I think it's going to be definitely the most... Can I just clarify possible. something? I, I'm certainly not talking about um, formative assessment. I'm not talking about summative assessment in the sense that these MOOCs still look like university courses in a lot of ways. You get a grade at the end. So I guess the question is more along the lines of, is that important? Is getting a grade important? There will obviously need to be formative assessment, which is just practising essentially what you've learned. But what's the role of getting a grade? How important is that? Is that important? Um, yeah, well, I, I suppose it's always a nice thing and it's a motivator. <laughs> it's just, yeah, well, um, it, it is a motivator, but... I, it's not going to be necessary for anything. Um, hmm. I, yeah, I mean, especially if um, it's not 100%, you know, if you ditch the accreditation side of things, hmm. I mean, then kind of you're looking at what is the point of a grade. I mean, if, if you're not looking at feedback and... You know, what is the point of a grade? Hmm. Ben, what do you think? Um, 
I guess one of the handy parts of being past the president is that you hear along the grapevine that there's someone creating a MOOC on actuarial studies somewhere in the university. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must say, when I first heard that, I thought to myself, who would want to do a MOOC on actuarial <laughs> studies? <laughs> but this is also coming from the guy who will now check out the physics pendulum swinging video, so I'm sure I'll dabble in your actuarial <laughs> MOOC one day. Um, regarding actually assessment and uh, coming out with a grade at the end of it, perhaps I differ on Sam's thoughts a little bit. Um, I guess if it comes down to a little bit of almost, yes, what's the purpose of a MOOC? Are you there for um, just to explore and you know broaden your horizons in terms of learning? Um, but I think the opportunity that MOOCs also provide is a first-hand experience. Um, I would say the advantage of producing a grade at the end would be that someone could then be like, oh, actually, I shouldn't have become a, a lawyer, as I may one day find out, and then think to myself, actually, I'll go and pursue actuarial studies and maybe then find accreditation you know, through a, a different course. The one huge disadvantage I guess I would see from it is um, someone maybe being discouraged that they've put in all this work and completed the course um, but not come out with the results that they've expected. And I'm sure for all of us, including Sam, who's ever taken any test, we've all experienced that, oh, what is this? I thought I deserved an A plus or an HD. Um, so I guess it's a bit of a dichotomy that exists. One would be encouraging people to then take the next step and maybe plunge in a little bit deeper and pursue that course. But uh, the one big downside that I would see would be yeah, discouraging also. Um, Phil, if you'll allow yeah. me to contribute a quick yeah. thing before we move on from the question. Um, it, while you're passing the mic, it'll be quick. Yeah. Uh, no, no, we'll one of my colleagues uh, who uh, has another Berkeley MOOC on artificial intelligence, they tried an experiment. After they, the first successful offering of their MOOC, they, they had set a pass threshold of some number. And on edX, you don't get a letter grade. You get sort of pass or no pass. The second time around, they, uh, as an experiment, they did pass with <laughs> distinction. If your final number of points was a, a higher than a, a higher threshold, you would get sort of a little virtual gold star, and you would get a nice signed letter from the instructor saying, good for you. And that's it. I mean, it's still no credit. And if you look at the histograms for the two, with, when they did the for distinction, there was this big cluster of grades right at the top where the threshold was. Um, so that's, Sam, as a programmer, do you know the site Stack Overflow? Oh, I love that site. OK, Stack <laughs> Overflow. For those of you who don't write code and are for those of you who are not fortunate enough to participate in humanity's greatest creative achievement of the There's 21st century. The if you, want to just... <laughs> you, you guys go right ahead. Uh, no, this, this, there's actually, I have a point. Uh, this is a, a forum where programmers ask questions, and depending on how many questions you answer, and if you see an answer to a question that you think is correct, you can upvote it. There's this very complex system of reputation points. And as you gain more reputation points, you actually achieve editorial powers on the site. So the more you contribute, the more authority you have to delete an appropriate post or to close off a line of discussion that isn't going anywhere. And what's amazing about this so site... It's a traditional game. It's a traditional game. It, exactly, yeah. exactly. And in fact, a colleague of mine did a, a sort of human studies experiment, uh, carefully looking at the logs. And there's a, a certain amount of social engineering you have to do to tweak these reward systems. But the bottom line is if you put a counter in front of somebody, they want to make that counter go higher. And th what their, their great goal was they tied the counter to editorial power, which gives you recognition as you are an editor. But it means that the people who, who use the site also curate it. It's genius. So I think there's a, actually many possible roles for assessment. But I think the bottom line is, if people can get more points, there's a, this thymotic urge for recognition that will make them want to get more points, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. And if you can find a way to use that to advantage, if you can get those people to say, great news, we're inviting you to be a volunteer teaching assistant for the next offering of the MOOC. We actually have done this, and it's the reason that our MOOC is sustainable. The best performing students are honored to be recognized as TAs and give back. And they actually help future cohorts. So this, the, you know, there's something happening here. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think assessment has a role to play, if only because of the gold star counter. Mm. OK, yes, question. Um, you've talked quite a lot about the benefits of MOOCs in terms of uh, teaching, feedback on your teaching, research, um, gathering data, and so on. Um, I'm interested in particularly Gabrielle's view and Amanda's view on, if you like, the marketing potential of, of MOOCs. So have you or some of your colleagues done a MOOC and as a sort of standalone 
course or piece or bite-sized chunk and then the demand has been so big for that 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 it's led to the development of the program uh, or things that have happened in the classroom as a result so what's the what's what's the benefits in terms of um, maybe recruitment or uh, other for, other benefits of if, if you like of the marketing benefits mm. of the MOOC Gabrielle, does it, does it so we haven't done our MOOC yet. We don't go live until April next year. But certainly one of the things we're trying to do is to get people interested in the topic, right? So marketing's a huge piece for us. You're just making me realise that I haven't thought about what we're going to do with all this increased demand if we manage, if we are successful in our marketing. So I, um, I'll make that, put that on my to-do list. Um, but certainly we want to, um, you know, we, we think we're onto an, an, an area that's underdeveloped and we really want to raise awareness and interest in it, so. Mm. How about it? Yeah. So uh, there's many kinds of marketing, but uh, I think for an instructor, one kind of marketing is tied in with a sort of uh, our, our egotism that our way of presenting a certain body of material is a really good way, maybe not the best way. Uh, so although this wasn't the intention, um, doing a MOOC of part of our Berkeley course put our approach in front of a lot of people, many of whom, not all of whom, responded positively. And some of the ones who responded positively, for example, were other instructors at other universities who then asked, could we use some of your materials in our classroom setting, which is where the whole Spock concept came from. Some of the ones who noticed it were uh, professionals, employers who are gonna recruit our students, who said, wow, this is, you know, the way you guys are teaching this material we think is really great. We, we're predisposed to wanna to recruit students who have gone through a program uh, that uses your ideas. So I don't know how you characterize the ROI on that marketing, but the, the psychic income for the instructors uh, has been really great. Um, I know that there's a lot of sort of institutional level, this increases brand awareness, and, and I'm sure those things are all true. I have no idea how to measure that, and that, I, I think most instructors don't have that view of the world, so I, I would like to defer to an administrator who, who has that view of the world to address that part of it. But I think it's, it's rare for teachers to have a voice that, that could get that loud, if you don't, you know, to, to put it a little bit bluntly. Uh, and for the ones who are good teachers, like Walter Lewin and his physics lectures, it's great for them and it's great for the world. So if that's marketing, that, you know, that's, that's our view of it. Is there anybody here in that, in that role who would like to comment on that? Because I, mean, I get a sense that universities do see this as, a, as an opportunity to, to and uh, you know, here's the dreadful word, because it's the, the, to, to increase their brand power. Yeah. <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, for the ANU, actually. Um, and and I, uh, I speak to my colleagues and other universities involved in edX in this, and I think it's um, it's still an experimental space in that in that sense, and it's a question of what uh, whether or not it's uh, direct marketing linked to recruitment, or whether or not it's about raising um, the brand profile and awareness of your institution, or whether it's about giving some reflection of your on-campus experience or whether or not it's about things like alumni and broader community engagement. So different universities are using it in different ways. So some universities are using it um, as, a, as a marketing activity. I don't know how directly you would be able to link it to recruitment, though I think that that's uh, a while off. Um, but one thing that I think is a really interesting development is in alumni and philanthropy. And Harvard in particular has gone very... Um, uh, being quite creative and big in that space, offering alumni-only courses, uh, asking their alumni to choose what sort of courses they were like um, taught and using them as an engagement tool with their alumni, which in Harvard's case in particular always ends up in contributing to their extensive and um, jealousy-inspiring um, uh, uh, endowment that allows the university to do the work that it does. So I think that they have lots of different, um, uh, lots of different potentials, but I don't think anyone can tell you straight up this will definitely assist recruitment or this will definitely assist our profile or this will definitely assist our, um, our alumni engagement as it is in the teaching space. It's still experimental space mm. and we're learning. But, but it's a case of where universities, institutions uh, feel that this opportunity is too valuable not to be in, even though we're not quite sure down the track what will happen. Uh, yes, did, was there a question over here? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, sir, we're, I, I had you, so... <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm interested. So far we've had a discussion about taking existing course and mookifying them and putting them out there. But I'd be interested from uh, Amanda and Gabriella about how uh, institutions like Berkeley or ANU might use MOOCs, which we don't own, 
but is material which is, is out there by others and build that into programs that we might accredit. And uh, for Ben and Sam, what would be, you know, what would you like to see in the, come to, if you come to ANU and our programs, you're constrained to our programs, would you like to see, you know, compulsory as part of the, your degree programs that you should, ANU should, should be uh, asking you to go out there and look at other material and, and accredit a, uh, a resource which is, is uh, made available from elsewhere? Hmm. Gabrielle? I, you know, I think so. Certainly, that's where where my thinking is. I haven't I haven't done the administrative details about you know whether or not it's feasible and, and all that sort of stuff. But it seems to me it's nuts not to do it. That you know, if you um, particularly in where where, you, where the resource is scarce, which is is in the field that I'm interested in, where there aren't very many people who do it and who are good at it, that you wouldn't draw on the best people around the world um, as part of your course just strikes me as nuts. Um, so. You know, I think that's so. That's certainly something that I'd like to see developed further. Mm. But um, I do see that as part of the, as part of the university. I mean, if I understand the thrust of your question, is that do universities now evolve via MOOCs to say, well, look, the education is not just what you're being offered here at Berkeley, and you can read widely, but it's also you can go directly somewhere else, and that uh, that's part of the Berkeley experience too. Sure. Well, I mean, in the U.S., it's, it's already fairly common for there to be some level of cross articulation agreement for certain courses, uh, and Again, I think as with so many other things, MOOCs are kind of forcing this issue and they're accelerating the conversation about, well, suppose I claim to have taken a MOOC on some topic that Berkeley offers a required course on. Can't I just take some sort of exam or other, an interview with a faculty member, whatever it takes to prove that I know this material? Why should I have to waste my time repeating the course? And by the way, sitting in a seat that could be occupied by another student who hasn't had that course. So I think as a matter of reality, this is going to happen. I think uh, it'll be painful for universities because we're large bureaucracies that don't move terribly quickly. Uh, you know, cross-articulation, even within the University of California system, uh, is, is already sort of an ad hoc and messy process. But I think we're going to be forced into doing a better job of it. Uh, I think instructors are going to borrow materials from each other and, and sort of start blending other instructors' ideas into their courses. But I think there's also a role for saying, if you can learn software engineering better from someone at MIT than you can from me, go ahead and learn it. And, you know, we, Berkeley has expectations of, of what we're going to assess to make sure that you know it. But if you're willing to meet that assessment criterion, uh, you know, it makes no sense for us to force our way of, of teaching upon you if there's a better way available elsewhere, if it works better for you. So I think as a matter of reality, this is going to happen. And, you know, before MOOCs, the idea that, uh, you know, a student could go online and choose five different versions of introductory physics, that just wasn't in our conceptual vocabulary, right? We, we live in the age of miracles and wonder. If somebody had told you 10 years ago, 10 years ago, right? I, I've been teaching only a little bit longer than that. If somebody had said, within 10 years, you'll be able to type in uh, a key phrase for a course or a topic, instantaneously get links to a dozen courses, all for free, with videos and interactive assessments, taught by the best professors at the world's best universities, with no charge, by providing an email address. And by the way, you can also talk to people online, and it'll all be free. So what's happened to the university? Gabriel? <laughs> they do more good stuff. You, you, you go there to, to do the real work. No, but it's, uh, you're, describing, you're, descri you're describing an institution. Well, you're not describing an institution, actually, at all. We just, you're describing the end of an institution. You're describing a, a learning environment which, which has really leapfrogged the institution. The, institution. the evolution of an institution. That doesn't really exist anymore. Gabriel, do you have any comment on that? Well, gotcha. I guess, as I said earlier, I think that the real um, benefit for universities is that we can put our effort back into real teaching and real learning. So it's not the transmission of information that can be done um, effectively online, but what we can do is, you know, tutorials and practicals and things have become dead because we can't afford them, but they actually then become the stuff of learning again. And that's, and you know, what we, all of us enjoy pontificating, but what we also really enjoy is interacting with smart people and getting their ideas and watching them grow and, and you know, you go back to having the ability to do that. It's incredibly exciting. Mm. Okay, question over here. Gentleman in the red top, yeah. So, just to follow on from this point, sort of, 10 years ago there were five different textbooks available on a particular topic, one of which was the recommended textbook for a particular course. Mm -hmm. But in theory, students would have had the ability to go and access any other textbook around. Obviously, the internet gives us a much larger set of things that you can look up. 
Um, but the concept of having multiple different resources to, to look at is not really that new. Um, one thing that most of the online resources seem to have in common is short bite-sized chunks of information followed by potentially some exercises to check whether you've understood what's just been presented. And I think that mode of learning can have a lot of very, you know, good benefits for a lot of students. But one of the biggest things that I got out of my university education here at ANU was the ability to teach myself things. And I think the ability to pick up a book read through a significant chunk of it and understand what the book's telling me is something that I very, very much value from my university education. Is there a problem with the fact that most of these MOOCs are condensed into bite-sized sort of chunks, that we're preventing students from learning more lengthy, you know, from more lengthy, broader documents? Hmm. Anybody like to take this on? Could I ben, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, this was again something uh, that I think John um, touched on in the last series. One of the physics professors here at the ANU, um, and I guess it touches on this new concept of flipped classrooms and how that also perhaps ties into MOOCs, um, really providing students with bite-sized chunks of a lecture. Um, 15 or 20 minutes that are easily digestible as opposed to one or two hour long blocks um, and then following that with some form of assessment. Essentially providing students with uh, a manageable amount of work that they can do in their own time um, and then working off that. I think the difficulty in that uh, sphere, and perhaps Armando and Gabriel can touch on this, is that the amount of work that goes into producing a high quality 15 or 20 minute production is actually quite large. Um, so that initial expenditure of time and money into the development of a MOOC or an online course that's specific in that um, sense of providing bite-sized chunks and uh, relative assessments is quite difficult. And then afterwards, I guess, the um, updating and upgrading of it becomes a bit easier. In terms of uh, resourcing and multiple resourcing, uh, not being a new concept. I think, like you mentioned, with uh, the internet, things have changed drastically. And even now, I guess, with, if I can draw on a personal experience, even with law readings, it's, I'm never going to go out and read the multiple, and Albert will probably agree that you would never read the other available options, simply because, I guess, it's, it's not appealing. I think the opportunity that MOOCs provide is um, it's not only a different resource, but it's kind of that the best possible alternative um, to what you're already receiving, and it's easily digestible. I think um, perhaps you touched on it. It's really a matter of providing students or those engaging with this um, new online form of learning with an option that's better than what they're already receiving. Otherwise, I don't think people would look to it as an alternate source of, or alternate resource. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, go, yeah. Follow, can we just put you on the mic to follow that question? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I may not have made my point completely clear. I agree with you, it's an incredibly attractive and in the most case, very effective and better way of learning things. But I'm worried that we're cutting out something <laughs> by focusing attention on these more easily digestible right. things. I think so. and that I, was the, yeah. I, I don't know that I agree with that. I mean, you know, I think you're raising some important points, but I think you may also be conflating some points that, that ought to be kept separate. Um, so regarding the observation, for example, about you, you learn how to teach yourself, you learn how to learn, uh, and then you can sort of go off and, and read a fairly lengthy tome about something and absorb it. I have read probably 50 programming books. But that's not how you learn to program. You learn to program by reading a chapter and then struggling with something to get it to work in your code. And there's nothing that can substitute for that experience. So it's teaching myself how to learn is a combination of digesting someone's explanation of a concept and then trying to turn around and apply that concept in a novel situation that isn't in the textbook. I think to the extent that these bite-sized chunks force the instructor to draw some boundaries and say, OK, we're going to build up a series of complex concepts so that you can do a difficult task. 
as the instructor, I'm going, I have an opinion about some boundaries I can draw around the concepts such that at each boundary, we can make sure you're still on board. And then when we go to put all the concepts together, that's when you struggle with the material and apply it to your own code. I think really a lot of people sort of learn that way now. I think I certainly do. And what the MOOC experience made me do is actually sit in the student seat and try to put myself in the position of, okay, if I were the student, where would I be drawing these boundaries? What were the concepts that I had to sort of internally master one at a time before I could put them all together? So I, I don't think that uh, we're sort of taking away the ability to absorb long chunks of stuff because I don't think that ability was ever really there. I think a lot of knowledge, you, you may think you're learning that way, but until you have to actually apply it to a new situation, I don't know if I'm convinced that, that someone has really learned it. Um, and I don't think that most people I know read the whole book before applying anything. I think they read a little, apply, read, apply, and they get stuck. And that's the point where I think the breakdown actually is useful. But I completely agree with you. In terms of, sorry, I'm sorry. But I completely agree with you that that's the way you have to learn from the, the lengthy tome. But I'm saying, are we actually preventing students from learning that specific so I think skill? I, yeah. Gabriel, back to you. I agree with you because I think we don't know whether by giving people bite-sized chunks, and that's all we're giving at the moment, whether we're doing something to the, somebody's capacity to follow a complex argument through to conclusion. And I, you know, that there's, if you think about philosophy or other areas where you can't, you can't get the idea across in a 30-second grab or in a 10-minute lecture, you've got, to, you've got to kind of layer it and build it up. Um, and we don't know yet whether... So I, I think this is one of those cases where computing, computer programming is different. Um, you don't, we don't know what it does to people's ability to think, you know, think for a long time, I guess. That's the, that, and I, you know, I think that's an open question. Mm. OK. Yes, yeah, back to you, sir. You wanted to... Um, as yeah, Ben said, one of my degrees is in law, my other degree is in science, and in my science degree I did chemistry, which requires a lot of like hands-on technical lab skills. Uh, so my question is, is there like a box of subjects that can be put in, it's like the MOOCs category that can be covered by MOOCs, and is there like other subjects that can be excluded by MOOCs, and do you think that MOOCs should be developed in some way to like cover these sort of subjects? So as in like particular lab skills in chemistry or I don't know. I'm sure there's other subjects that... Okay, we can discuss maybe. Jane Austen online, but can we actually examine the chemical properties of a, of a substance online? Amalu? I, I think, the, uh, not to cop out, but I'd say let's ask that question again in five or six years. I think where MOOCs are now... Uh, does anybody remember the web in 1994? <laughs> okay, try to those of you who were born, okay, or the, try to remember the web in 1994 and try, see if you can predict Facebook, right? Technologically... Almost nothing changed about the web, except the computers got faster and more people got broadband. But none of the technologies that were used to build Facebook were fundamentally absent in 1995. People just hadn't thought far enough ahead to figure out all the new ways they could recombine them. So I think, it, I think it's kind of too early to say. You know, the, the MOOCs of today, in five years, are going to look really simplistic. And that's as it should be. Uh, so I would say, let's get together again in five years and, and see where the results are going. Because I, I think it's, it's too early to call. What, what, yeah, I've got two questions at the back here. What, what, just while we take the microphone up there, what, what is, is computing power, or Moore's law, albeit uh, withstanding, is, it, is computer power the, the single biggest hurdle at the moment to, to the expansion of, of MOOCs? No, but I think it was until a few years ago. Hmm. I mean, the, the idea that you could put video online and have it be distributed everywhere, unlimited free, was, was, that was, makes was. no economic sense. There's no reason to believe that should ever work, and let, but there is YouTube, right? Uh, the idea that computing power, in the United States, you can rent computing power from Amazon for about five cents an hour uh, for a non-trivially uh, mm. powerful computer. So for, you know, a, a few dollars an hour, we rent enough computers to do the fairly intensive work of automatically grading a lot of student assignments. So I think a necessary condition was computing power to get cheap enough and accessible enough to a lot of end users that the, the fabric was there. Uh, now that the fabric is there, people, I think, will unleash their creativity on what you can do with it. So I think we're kind of just at the beginning of this. Mm. I'm, I'm an optimist. OK, yes. Uh, just a brief comment that I think some of the issues you raise certainly have been tackled by traditional online and distance learning sort of uh, universities. So I'm aware that, that at UNE, they actually uh, have tested students controlling their experimental, uh, sorry, their chemistry instrumentation uh, remotely so people can control their GCs and HPLCs and things like that and run analytical chemistry experiments from anywhere in the world. So that's quite effective. 
Yeah. Okay. We can take, we've got time for one more. I think, do we have one more there? Uh, one more question? Um, all right. If, if not, I think we, we might wrap up. It's, uh, we've uh, uh, we've uh, had a, a good grapple with the issue. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming and also to thank our guest tonight, Professor Armando Fox from uh, the University of California at Berkeley. Um, uh, Sam Parkinson from Year Eight. It's a bit early to come to university, but uh, but uh, but uh, I think one of the things we've learned from the, the discussion tonight is that that question itself may be a rather rather uh, a rather superfluous one too. Uh, and Gabrielle, um, good to good to see you and hearing your contributions and uh, and and Ben too. Um, thank you for your contributions as well, and thank you for coming. And we'll wrap it up this uh, blow up the lecture series for tonight on the on the subject of MOOCs and where they're going. Thanks everybody for coming and thank you to the panel. Thank you.